Hello? Okay, let's get this started. Uh, my name is Li Ying, uh, and uh, this is Jing Wei, and uh, both of us work on the data infra team at the Airbnb. So today we're gonna talk about how we're building the data products on Spark at the Airbnb. So first, before we dive deep into the data products, first let's take one step back to see what's the overview of the data infra at Airbnb. As you can see here, there's two major incoming data sources. The first is the analytics event sent from the web servers, all kinds of service. These events will be published into Kafka, and we will run the batch ingestion job to read from Kafka data and land into the warehouse. The second major source of data is coming from MySQL. So Airbnb using MySQL as the primary online storage. So we run a batch job to ingest the MySQL daily snapshot into the warehouse. Based on these two data sources, we can derive more data set in the warehouse. And we have two major data warehouses. We call the gold and the silver. So these two data, these two data warehouses serve to two different purposes. First, they can give us some isolation. So critical pipelines running on the gold cluster and the ad hoc pipelines running on the silver cluster. Also, we need the air to replicate the data from gold cluster to silver. So the critical data set will be on both gold and the silver cluster. In addition to that, we're using Airflow to schedule the batch processing jobs. So user can define their data processing pipeline in Airflow using different query engines like Spark, Hive, or Presto. We also have the data visualization tool like Superset, provides people a more user-friendly interface to slice dice the data to run interactive query to get more insights of data. So both Rayair, Superset, and Airflow are open sourced and Airflow right now actually is an Apache project. So last year, we actually started new initiatives to onboard the streaming processing at Airbnb as well. We take advantage of the Spark streaming job to consume events from Kafka, apply different computation logic, and write the data to different things. We write to Datadog for dashboard and alerting, write to DynamoDB for online serving, write to Elasticsearch for like online indexing. So we often say building data products requires to implement the Lambda architecture. So what is the Lambda architecture? So Lambda architecture is a data processing architecture to handle large scale data by taking advantage of both streaming and batch processing. It attempts to balance the latency, throughput, tra throughput and the fault torrent by leverage batch processing to present a comprehensive view of the batch offline data. In the meanwhile, using streaming processing to get the view of the online data. It also need to merge the offline data with the online data in a, compre in a comprehensive view before presenting to the end user. The rise of the Lambda architecture is correlated to the, the growth of the big data the streaming processing, and the effort to try to mitigate the traditional MapReduce kind of batch process. So since we have both the batch processing infra and the streaming infra, so the next steps is very naturally try to unify this streaming processing and the batch processing together. So we build a new framework called Airstream. The goal of Airstream is try to unify both streaming and the batch and provide a single computation interface. So user can apply the same computation logic on both streaming pipeline and the batch pipeline. In addition to that, the Airstream also provides a shared state store. The shared state store is try to share the state across multiple streaming and the batch jobs, also, play, also, play, um, also uh, serve as a final storage to merge the streaming result with the batch, batch result. And we will get more detail into that. So first, let's maybe take one example 
to illustrate how Airstream can combine the streaming processing with the batch processing. So in Airstream, user only need to specify three different parts. The first is the source, which defines where the data coming from. It could be streaming source or it could be static like a batch source. The streaming source could be a Kafka topics, like multiple Kafka topics. And the batch source could be a hive table, a hive partition, or even a result of a hive query. The second part is to define the computation, how we're going to process this incoming data source. User can use Spark SQL or using different UDFs to compute these data frames for both streaming and the batch. The next stage, user can define the syncs as where the data finally were written into. These syncs can also be shared in both streaming case and batch case. In this particular example, the data can write into HBase is a distributed key value storage. And in the streaming case, the streaming job will write through HBase directly using some HBase native API. In the batch case, they will generate HBase H file and bulk upload that file into HBase. So both syncs and the computation logic can be shared between both streaming pipelines and batch pipeline. In addition to that, like a um, user can specify multiple steps or multiple stages of process and the syncs. Like each result of this process can write to different things. So as you can see that it's a DAG-like dependency, it's a computation flow. So it's not only the process logic, the, the process operator itself will be unified for both streaming and the batch. Actually the Intel pipeline, the Intel computation flow can be shared in both streaming job and batch job. To recap, User only need to write a job configuration. The job configuration defines the source, either the static source for batch job or the streaming source for the streaming job. The computation logic, the operator, the syncs, and the Intel computation dependency flow can be shared for both streaming and the batch. In addition, Airstream can provide like a single driver interface, like a single Airstream driver can run both streaming job and batch job. That covers how we unify the streaming processing with the batch process. The next, we're going to talk about how we like take advantage of the shared state storage. So when, there's, a, there's multiple reasons we need a shared storage. Like the first, uh, when, there's some stateless and a stateful like a, a Spark streaming processing. And for the stateful processing, oftentimes we need to share the state across multiple jobs. And so this state is not just unique or local to one particular job. It needs to be global accessible by multiple jobs. Another reason is we need a shared state store to merge the results of this batch job and the streaming job together before it can present to the end users. And in Airstream, we choose using HBase as a shared state store. So why HBase? So HBase is a distributed multi-column family, multi-version, key value storage. It's built on top of the HDFS, and it's modeled after Google's big table. We choose EdgeBase because it is well integrated with the Hadoop ecosystem. So user can use the native EdgeBase API or write a MapReduce job using the Hive EdgeBase connector, Spark EdgeBase connector, or Presto connector to access EdgeBase directly. It can also provide an efficient way or efficient API to handle both streaming updates and the batch updates. That's actually a major differentiate compared to other key value storage. Also, HBase can provide a rich API to support sequential reads and the point lookups like the multi get API. In HBase, each row key can have multiple versions. And we leverage this multi-version feature to merge the result for both streaming and the batch. So let's dig deep into how we actually unify the right API and how to take advantage of these streaming rights and the batch rights. 
So when we're using edge based table in Airstream case, we always pre shadow the table into a fixed number of regions. So when we want to load that data frame into edge base, we repartition the data frame based on the region keys. So each partition will be corresponding to one region in edge base. During the streaming job, they will write through edge base using the multi API directly. It avoids to causing too many connections to across different regions because it's simply one to one mapping. During the batch case, for each partition, they can generate its own edge file and upload that particular file to edge base. That takes advantage of the LSM, the log, log structured merge tree of edge base, so user can upload the, the, the database file directly into the database. From the end user perspective, it can provide a unified API for, for these writes, for both streaming case and the batch case. And internally, it choose the efficient way to handle the bug upload. That's the major difference um, compared to other key value storage. For read API, there's a, a lot of like a rich for API we can choose. The multi get for point lockups, the prefix scan, the long range scan, the time range scan. A user can choose this read API based on the application logic and the table schema. And we, can, we actually have a few other slides later to share the use case, how we use these APIs to compute a long window, like moving average, or long window, like unique count. So in edge base, like each row key can have multiple versions. It can be used to merge the result for both streaming and a batch. Here's one particular example. As the streaming job runs, the streaming job can keep can keep update a particular row key with different value and a different version. As you can see here, the R1 actually have three version with three different value. So that when the batch job actually available, the batch processing will also update R1 with a different value and a different version. So now when user query R1, actually the user can get the merged view of both, from both streaming and the batch. The actual merge logic can be shared, or the actual merge logic can be customized for each application. For instance, if user want to query R1 at a particular timestamp, like a timestamp 101, it can get all the merged value before and at that particular value. So to recap, we believe Airstream provides two major foundations. First, is try to unify the streaming process with the batch process. So user can use their single computation interface, a single, sing, the, 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 the same computation logic for both streaming and the batch. It also provides a shared state store to share the state across multiple streaming jobs and batch jobs and merge the final state before present to end users. So with that, uh, Jin Wei is going to talk about more use case, how we leverage Airstream to build the Lambda architecture for data products. Okay. Uh, so first, thanks, Lee, for giving us an uh, introduction of uh, Airbnb data infrastructure and the two foundations we use when we apply the Lambda architecture into our work. Uh, next, I'm going to drill down into a couple user cases and uh, share some of uh, lessons we learned and uh, tips as well. So the first user case I'm going to talk about is a, a database snapshot. Uh, sometimes we also call them a database export. Uh, the task is, uh, uh, is very simple. Basically, we want to get the data out of production MySQL database into Hive uh, uh, data warehouse. Uh, there was four major challenges for us. Uh, when the data size is a small, uh, database is small, it's relatively easy. Uh, for us, uh, all the Airbnb data stores in a couple uh, large MySQL database, uh, getting the data out of them becomes quite challenging. Uh, the second challenge is the real timeness. Uh, most of our analytics pipeline can torrent uh, a day of delay. But some cases, for example, fraud detection, uh, anomaly detection, this kind of pipeline will require hours, uh, hourly delay, maybe at most, or 
uh, even minutes. Um, the third challenge is uh, how to guarantee the transaction boundary uh, when we export the data, given that the original data modification is uh, touched, is, is bounded by a transaction. Uh, in many applications, people modify multiple tables uh, in one transaction, try to guarantee the uh, correctness. But when we export the data, these data, these table, once they reach to the Hive, Met store, uh, Hive uh, data warehouse, they have to guarantee the uh, transaction semantics. Otherwise, analytics will be wrong. Uh, the last challenge we have is that uh, MySQL database people often uh, change their schemas. Uh, how we make sure that the schema change is propagated to data warehouse uh, automatically and correctly. Uh, this diagram illustrates some uh, the, uh, different versions of our solution over the times. Uh, so first, our first solution is just take a database. So first, our MySQL database is uh, AWS RDS instance. So we take a snapshot and restore to a, a rep replica, and then use a scooper to dump the data into, Hive, into HDFS. Because the database is really large, it takes over 20 hours to just create the back, uh, to restore the backup. And sometimes we will hit an incompatible restore failure and we, we don't even get a, a restore. And so the, the whole process takes over 24 hours, so, which become a problem for us. Uh, the improvement we did, the first improvement we did is that instead of restore the whole database, copy the data out, we uh, develop a, a tool called a spinal tab, which is a bin log listener, uh, listens on, on the uh, MySQL database changes. So we send the gather the changes, send it to Kafka, and uh, use Spark streaming job to process those changes. All the changes will uh, store in the edge base and merge with uh, a previous seeded snapshot, and then the final result will be delivered to Hive Data Warehouse. This solution works pretty good for, for some times, but we realize there are certain issues. For example, the, it's not a Lambda architecture. We have different code uh, for the streaming processing versus the uh, batch seeding. So maintenance becomes a little bit problem and it doesn't scale that well. Uh, it doesn't provide us a good uh, disaster recovery story. So the latest uh, solution we have is actually based on, uh, again, also based on Bing log. But instead of uh, listening on the Bing log directly, we, we just copy the Bing log to S3 buckets. So what that gives us is that we, not only, we are not only be able to get the real-time changes from the database, we can also keep a long history of our database changes. So we can keep years of transaction log in an S3 bucket. We have a unified uh, job. It can either run in streaming mode or in batch mode. They are exactly the same. They will process those bing log, apply the change to the edge base, and uh, uh, we can dump the data from HBase to Hive uh, data warehouse. Uh, in, in the same times, we will, the same job, we can share some of the computation component and uh, do the seeding from the uh, MySQL database uh, to bootstrap our process. Uh, so let me uh, drill more detail into this uh, job. And, uh, so the, from this diagram, you can see that if the input is a bin log, whether it's real time or history, it actually goes through a log passer first. And the log sep will be separated into three streams. One is a DDL, which we pass to the schema process that will actually uh, generate the database schema uh, at any given point in time and store in the edge base. Uh, the DML are, are the changes to the uh, data, and the change process will push them based on the schema into the edge base. We also keep track of the transactions, which is important. Uh, by keeping track of trans transactions, we can track uh, the transaction boundary, 
so that when we dump the data out of the edge base, we can guarantee uh, all the table, they, are, they meet the transaction semantics. At the same time, uh, the schema processor and the change processor are shared. They can use to directly uh, generate the seed, uh, receive from the uh, MySQL instance. Um, so one important thing is that we use my, uh, MySQL bin log position, which is a file number per, plus the offset as our timestamp for merge. Uh, the second important part is that all our uh, write operations are idempotent, which means that we can replay log at any given time window to do disaster recovery or reprocessing um, for that purpose. Uh, the second uh, case I'm going to talk about is uh, uh, related to the real-time indexing. So in, in Airbnb, we have many products. They require, provide a certain, uh, like for example, full text indexing and uh, search ability. But we really cannot build this on top of our production MySQL database. Uh, it basically, it's due to that uh, it's, the database is pretty much overloaded. So if you're adding all these additional features on top of that, it, it will just melt down, right? Uh, so the solution we provide, actually, we leverage this Lambda architecture and build a separate service to do this kind of indexing uh, into Elasticsearch uh, while in near real-time fashion. And uh, at the same time, uh, my, the main production MySQL database don't have much o uh, overhead. Uh, so again, so it's two parts. The first part is uh, uh, for the streaming part, events or the database mutation goes through Kafka, uh, goes through the Spark streaming job, uh, do all kinds of processing, and uh, maybe gather more data and uh, send it to the Elasticsearch. Batch case, we get the data from the Hive data warehouse, do the same computation. Uh, we can run the batch job either daily or hourly, or in some case, if we think the streaming job is good enough, we can just run once to pre-populate the index. Uh, so this pattern actually appears a lot in our uh, productions. Not only provide the search uh, capability, uh, in, for example, in some mobile growth scenario, people actually leverage this pipeline and push the end data to an external HTTP endpoint to uh, do different things. Uh, then the, the third major user case is uh, how we do the real-time OLAP analysis uh, using uh, leverage Druid and the Spark streaming. So again, this is also same, same as the previous example. This is a Lambda architecture. Uh, what I show here is simply a streaming version of the pipeline. Data goes through Kafka, and uh, the streaming job will separate the data into dimension and metrics, and use the Druid beam sent to uh, Druid to do the real-time indexing. Uh, there, there is a separate batch pipeline to do the to load the data to Druid uh, in batch fashion. Right now, it is still in Hadoop, uh, using a MapReduce job, but we th we are planning to move to Spark as well, so that uh, both can be unified. Uh, when after the data gets loaded into Druid, uh, we have a sup we have a tool called a superset, right? And uh, superset can actually connect to the Druid and uh, run slice and dice on different uh, data set and do near real-time analysis, which is really powerful. Right? Uh, if you do some experiment, uh, you can visualize it uh, in near real-time. Um, yeah. So these are three main uh, user cases I want to talk about today. We have a lot more user cases which uh, um, people, it grows a lot in, in the last uh, year or so. When, when this architecture being used by different teams and uh, uh, they are grow organically in the 
in the comp inside company. Uh, the next, I'm going to share some of the uh, tips and uh, lessons we learn uh, when we apply this uh, architecture. So uh, the first, uh, the first uh, uh, thing I'm going to talk about is a moving window computation. So normally when we do the streaming computation, you want to do some operation based on a certain window. Uh, if the window is small, it's not a problem. You can cache the data in, in memory. What if you want to process, your window is like a year long? Then there's lots of data you need to be cached, and uh, sometimes if your process crashed, restart, those history is gone. So uh, for us, we, luckily we, because we use HBase as a, a shared state store, storage, we can do this kind of long window computation based on HBase. Uh, the first example I'm going to give is how to do a distinct count in a, a large window. Uh, suppose we have, uh, suppose we want to figure out how many unique users have visited uh, a particular Airbnb listing over the last uh, 30 days. Right? So to answer that question, uh, you can do, you can build a 30 day window and just do a group by do a distinct count. Uh, but that normally won't work if in, in the, in the, for the reason that I gave pre before. What we do is that we store the data in HBase using listing ID and the visitor ID as key. By using those two composite key, we can do the, basically can do the distinct user count uh, um, for, for each listing. When we, you do, when we do the query, we just do a prefix scan with a given time range. The time range will be 30 days. Uh, so the next thing is uh, uh, count. Right? Uh, uh, count within a very large uh, window. Um, so what we do is that we store the listing and the counting using the HBase count API. And uh, we do two queries. Query the count at the beginning of the window and the count at the end of the window. By subtracting those two numbers, we get uh, uh, the count of within a, a sliding window. Uh, another thing that, because we have a shared uh, st uh, state store, it's nice that we can provide the interactive query on the real-time data. Uh, by providing the Presto connector and the Hive connector and SQL connector. So the query can be, the query, we can use the, uh, the SQL lab to do the inter interactive query on top of our real-time data. Um, so another thing that uh, we have a schema, uh, a Swift schema ex uh, uh, object so that we can trans transform our data into a uh, data frame. Uh, so I'm going to skip this. So. At, at the end, uh, I want to uh, emphasize uh, two things. Right? Uh, the first uh, lesson we learned that I think it's important to have a unified batch and uh, streaming uh, computation. Ideally, we want to have just one job. The only difference is uh, the source definition. The reason that source normally will have different format and they need a different a per, different kind of preparations, so it's okay to have a, a different source definition, but the computation and the sync should be same. Uh, the second lesson we learned that is uh, global state store give us a unique advantage. Many of our user case is enabled by, because we have a shared uh, global state store. So uh, that, uh, draw the conclusion of my talk. Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, we have we have been doing this work for a while, and uh, uh, I think it's uh, uh, important to share this uh, the lesson we learned with you guys. And by the way, we have uh, a happy hour going on today at 6 p.m. in the B restaurant bar. If you are interested and want to learn more detail, uh, you are welcome to join us. Thank you.